Hello everyone. Another episode of Herald Tribune World Youth Forum from 1954. This episode youngsters talk about new developments in formerly dependent areas and participated following students. Alfred Clayton Bannerman from Gahana. Chitranjan Kapoor from India. Francisco Ariano Bellic Jr. from Mexico. Raul L. Conreras from Philippines. Genevieve Martineau Simas from France. Presenter of the discussion is Mrs. Helen Height Waller. Here we go to the video. Than constructive. Oh, yeah. Well, but oh. if you go back to history, you see that Great Britain, for instance, was colonized by the Romans. Well, and at present, I mean, we are being colonized by Great Britain, for instance, and we've benefited from that colonization. So, I mean, I think colonization is, I mean, really constructive rather than destructive. Well, why don't you stop to think for a minute that all of this has been because they got selfish purpose. I can prove to you right now that every country who's been uh, trying to colonize somebody or to uh, give them help, economical or whatnot, has had selfish purposes. Yeah. Well, that's not true with when we come to the motive that America colonized. This is the world we want. Each week, young people from the four corners of the earth come together to discuss the world we want. They are brought here by the New York Herald Tribune Forum for High Schools under the direction of Helen Hyatt Waller. Welcome to our forum discussion. You've come in in the midst of an argument about whether or not colonialism has been a constructive force in world history. It started out rather one side as the only colonial power represented. The other four countries here tonight are the Gold Coast and the Philippines, India and Mexico. But let me introduce you now to the students who are here for the discussion. First of all, Alfred Bannerman from the Gold Coast, we call him Nini. Uh, he had a good time down at Atlantic City High School when he became a member of the Mighty Molecules, wasn't it? Yes, the Chemical Society. The <laughs> Chemical yeah. Club in the high school. Mm -hmm. Next is Chitranjan Kapoor from India. Cheat, as we call him, 16 years old, had an especially good time up at St. Mark's or er, uh, Kent School because he feels at home in an atmosphere where the students call the masters, sir. Francisco Arellano, whom we call Paco, comes from Mexico. He's 17, working real hard in the high schools here, but he works even harder at home because Paco is going to two high schools at once, a Mexican high school in the daytime in case he wants to go to a Mexican university, and in spare time, an, an American high school in case he wants to go to MIT. Uh, finally, uh, Geneviève Martineau from France, and uh, who did I forget? Raul, Raul I'm sorry, <laughs> Raul Contreras from the Philippines, 15 and a half. Uh, tonight, we're talking about colonial areas, former colonial areas, and their part in the world, areas that are now talked about as underdeveloped areas. Before we get back into the discussion, I think we ought to define just what you mean by underdeveloped. What do you mean by underdeveloped area? I think uh, underdeveloped area country uh, area is one which was uh, up till some time back under the domination of some foreign power. And with that power did not develop the resources of that area uh, because it wanted to profit itself. And it may have developed incidentally, you know, because it, uh, in the process of its own economic development. How much of the world is underdeveloped, would you say? I think a large part of the world. About 75% of the world's population and about 50% of the world's area, inhabited area. 50% well, of the world population is considered to be literate, and another 50% of the world's inhabited area or population is said to be underdeveloped. And well, undernourished is what he means, with no food. I think the UN figures are about half the world yes. is both half hungry... The world? Half the world? Half yes. the world. I, sh I should mm. think so, because Africa, for instance, has got a large part of underdeveloped area, and Southeast Asia, for instance, has got a large part of underdeveloped area. And does likewise... That, does that no, surprise you, Shadia? Yes, give? it does, really. <laughs> because in my country, we, we have some poor peoples, but, but we haven't got an idea of oh. the half of the world could be so, really, so poor and doesn't have enough to heat or... Uh, well, not actually poor in my case. I mean, not developed technically. Because if you come to Africa, we are not poor in the Gold Coast, for instance. We've got a lot of food, and it is monkeys who eat bananas, which you, I mean, you really like in France. And so, actually, not <laughs> that we are poor, but, I mean, we are not developed technically, I should say. I no, but yes. you know, I think what she means and, uh, is that uh, one-third of every, uh, of the population of the world 
earns the year fifty dollars. Uh, their national income, you know, their yearly income, it's amounts up to fifty dollars a year. A and third of the world's a population. A third of the world's population, yes. They earn and that's less definitely than fifty dollars a year, and uh, two thirds, I think, earn less than two hundred dollars a year. So it is very low. It may be fascinating yes. to some, but to us in India, it's not, because we see it every day, and we know that uh, it's quite true. Because in India, the average income of a rural worker is about uh, annual income is about twenty-two dollars only. Twenty-two dollars yes. a year. Yes, twenty-two dollars a year. Yeah, only twenty-two. Tell me, uh, are there any vestiges of colonialism left? in those of your countries that formerly belong to another yeah. power. In India, there are quite a lot. For example, we have uh, illiteracy, ignorance among the masses, and uh, the British tried to increase the class also, the class disintegrate. Well, in my case, I think it is the educational, I mean, political pattern, which to me is very bad. I think that's the last trace of colonialism, which, I mean, exists in the Gold Coast now. Because I think the Gold Coast is living right through the last stage of colonialism now. I think we are now on the threshold of self-government. And so there is no mistake in my saying that, I mean, uh, we've got oh, yeah. colonial institutions yeah. in the Gold Coast now. Speaking about the Philippines, well, the most significant trace of colonialism that we have right now is the Catholic religion which uh, Spain brought over. And there are so many traces of it, too, in uh, the pattern of education in most of the private schools. The school is not compulsory in your country, is it? Well, uh, in the Gold Coast, it's not, but it is free in the primary stages. <coughs> the Indian Constitution says that every every uh, ch child should uh, get at least primary education, if not more than that, in the next ten years. The same is true in my country, and what's more, the only thing that I really uh, think that colonialism has left behind is the hatred for the gringo that... Well, I must hatred quite a... for the gringo? Yes. You that's... mean us by yes. that, don't yes. you? Yes. Is there a lot of it in Mexico? A lot. As a matter of fact, you... Uh, I don't think you could uh, imagine how much you're not liked in Mexico. <laughs> Maybe you better tell us, Paco. Well, the, there's quite an amount of reasons for this. Uh, most of the, uh, I mean, I believe that the principal reason for this is that most in every Latin American country, I'm not speaking it alone for, for Mexico or by Mexico, the uh, foreign companies, that is English, French, and uh, American companies control practically everything. And you find that unless you have the raw materials, that is that the nation controls its own raw materials, cannot progress, and it cannot progress because in order to make investments go around, it has been forced to sell to the uh, companies, to the foreign companies, uh, legal concessions. And uh, those legal concessions, even though they do give a small profit to the nation, it is not the same as it would be if they could hold everything. So you see, there is a reason there. But Paco, is this dislike of the gringos, as you call us, yes. as great now in Mexico as it was, say, at the time of the expropriation mm. of the oil? Well, not exactly. It was. Uh, See, you've heard a lot about the hospitality in Mexico, and it also, it, all of it is true, but the thing is that most of the people who go to Mexico, tourists or whatnot, they go with the idea of trying to convert or trying to compare their standard of living, and you cannot do that with any country of the world, because it's well known for everybody that the United States has a, the highest standard of living. I'm sure every one of the uh, students would agree that you can't yes, compare sure. it. Cheat, I wanted to ask you a question. What about the idea of white supremacy? Is that dead in Asia? What exactly do you mean, Ms. Lowe? When we were talking about vestiges of colonialism, Mm -hmm. We know that for a time in Asia, there was, whatever you want to call it, a myth or an idea or a supposition yes. of white supremacy. Is that completely dead now? At least in India, we don't have any color thing. In it. We don't say that the white is more better than the colored. All are equal. Well, I think in Africa, it's side by side. I mean, it's now dying, and at the same time, we are giving birth to new white supremacy. If you come to the Gold Coast now, it is dying. And obviously, I think before the end of this year, the whites are going to, I mean, leave out the, I mean, get out the supremacy from the Gold Coast. But if you go to certain parts in Africa, it is now reviving. I mean, it's awakening from the death. Uh, one more <laughs> question to you, Chi. Uh, what about, you say there's no difference between uh, Western and Eastern. What about the Anglo-Indians in India, the people who are half European and half Indian? Are they fully accepted members of society? Oh, yes, they're as fully as myself. <laughs> there are no disabilities whatsoever? No, not at all. Our constitution gives them, I think, some special rights also. So, those, because they're in the minority group, so they have more rights than us even. There are more advantages also. They have some members specially nominated to parliament for their sake, though they are free to take part in all the elections. 
Uh, now you've gotten us on the verge of another subject that I'd like to go into next, yeah. which is what we're talking about underdeveloped areas and how you're developing. What activity, what developmental activity in your country right now is your government most concerned with? I think we'd like to he hear from each of the four of you on that. Well, I think in my country, we've got three phases of development. The first one is agricultural development. The second one is educational. And the third one is political. <coughs> Well, as to my country, I don't believe that the greatest campaign that the uh, government is taking now into consideration is the um, education of the masses and not of the individuals. And to Can organize you tell us in Mexico how quickly you have raised the literacy rate? Well, I think that all of it has been based on patriotism, ma'am. About, oh, I guess 10 years ago, there was a campaign that was coming from the uh, uh, presidency of the nation, and it, it, it said that every Mexican should teach five Mexicans. And if we could accomplish that, Within a number of uh, five to ten years, we could have most of the people to know how to read and write. But and it has well, 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 did I you think succeed it, in educating? Yes, we did. Yes, well, we did. Did, did you do, you do well? teach? Well, I think coming to that Just point... Just let Raul... Did you, do, did you perform any sort of that education which you said the government... Uh, well, I myself, I did, oh, to a certain extent. Not your maid by any chance. My well, maid, yes. Oh. I thought I had... <laughs> well, I... Yeah, uh, Go ahead. I think coming to that point, the Gold Coast is the leading country so far in the world in the campaign against mass illiteracy. Because uh, we are using the low budget system to educate people who couldn't get the opportunity. Of what going is to that, Nini? Uh, well, it is something like visual aids. We use signs, for instance, if we want to teach the letter S, we use the sign of snake. Oh. And we draw the snake just like the S. And so when the fellow sees the snake, um, I mean, the moment he sees the snake, he gets the letter in the head. <laughs> and so he starts learning how to write S through seeing the snake. And we How find long does it take well, it under this system to teach people to read I and think write? just about three weeks. I mean, it takes three, three weeks. weeks, yes. You learn the whole alphabet mm -hmm. in three weeks. Yes. See, I well, mean, people are able to read and write in three weeks. Well, and after the end of the campaign, they get certificates. Think, don't you think that form of educating those uh, illiterate ones is sort of primitive or...? No, the point is, I mean, it was invented by a French scientist, you know, it's a new system. And uh, uh, most of the people who undertake this education are elderly people. You see people at the age of 80 or 100 coming to learn how to read and write <laughs> what you know, before they die. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I really... Go ahead. I think it's the best system you can get, but it operates best in Africa, especially in the Gold Coast, simply because we do because get... Snakes. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> not God, <laughs> snakes. Well, I mean, if you want to operate that more than <laughs> sidewalk... Yeah. Oh, well, You've I mean, got tarantulas, <laughs> haven't you, in Mexico? Well, I mean, uh, we get people coming from all parts of the world, coming to see how we do operate on that system. We've got a lot of Americans visiting the Gold Coast, and the UNESCO is very much interested in that program. Well, how about the Mexican system, when you taught so many people to read so quickly? Yes. Did you use any simplified system like this? Well, we couldn't have a letter that looked like a car in the street, though, but <laughs> <laughs> what, we, what we did was that uh, the government gave out this uh, special tablets, you could say, and they had... Uh, well, all the letters, principal letters, and uh, basic principles to anybody to explain to anybody. And it really worked. And I'm very much surprised to find out from uh, uh, Gold Coast right here that he thinks that uh, Gold Coast is uh, far away advanced than any other country. Oh, what well, were you thinking? Not in this particular system. The UNESCO acknowledges the Gold Coast as being the leading country in the campaign against mass illiteracy. When you you Mexicans are education. pretty proud of your campaign <laughs> yes. against it. Oh, no, I right. think this is a wonderful subject on which you can compete with each other and see right. who's best. Paco, you were interrupted a moment ago when yes, you were telling what part you had in this mass literacy campaign. Did you teaching, teach well, five people how to read and write? Well, not quite five people, man, because I wasn't much of a teacher. I did it when I was 13, and I taught my mate how to read and write. And she got a certificate, did she? Well, she got my certificate. <laughs> Now, we skipped two of you when we were talking about what develop, did you developmental activity your government was stressing uh, most. What about India, Chet? At present, our government is concentrating on heavy industry because uh, the government realizes the importance of the heavy industry. See, any nation who has to be free and uh, advanced has to have its own uh, machine producing uh, uh, machines. And uh, we should not be dependent on any other country for those machines. And until and unless we get them, uh, bring, get them and produce them uh, in our country, we can't be uh, advanced as other countries are. So, but that doesn't mean that we are not uh, giving any attention to other things. Dam building and literacy works and all those, they are going on. But the most importance is being given to heavy industry at present. How about the Philippines, well, Ralph? Ours, on the other hand, my government is uh, stressing very much importance and the development of the agricultural industry 
and uh, most of the aid comes from the United States, I should say. Well, Tell us a little bit more about it, will you, Rao? What is the program? Well, you see, the, the Philippines and America are involved in a democratic partnership, as they call it. It's sort of uh, a system wherein they try to foster closer and a more harmonious relation between the peoples of the two countries. And uh, it also includes the sending of uh, U.S. equipment and commodities to the Philippines as approved by and recommended by Philippine and American experts. But uh, the Philippine government also plays a part in that. They have to provide the money so that those commodities sent by America can be used. How many Americans do you think you have in Philippines at the present? Americans? Yeah. Well, I don't know ex exactly, but I can tell you that the aim is to, to have a more diversified economy for the Philippines, greater production, and a higher income for the agricultural and industrial laborers. I mean, well, you, you, get, you get most of those things free, or you get it, I mean, in forms of, I mean, loans and all those things. Well, we, we get most of them free. Oh, well, free. I think, uh, I'm, afraid of, I mean, I'm afraid of this point, because we don't believe in getting things free from any country. Mm -hmm. Nor do There's a selfish purpose, purpose in behind all of that. Yes. Well, I don't purpose. think so. There is a selfish purpose. There must be. Because the purpose of America is to strengthen Philippine economy, because it believes that the Philippines gets much of its strength from developed rural communities. Oh, well, and I see. In the how I take it to be. I've seen that America is very much interested in the Far East countries, simply because they fear, I mean, there might be some communist colonization in those it. countries, you know, especially the Philippines. I think it is of strategic importance to the United States. Yeah. Well, if you come to Africa, for instance, I mean, we lack most of these things, you know, we don't get American aid. Well, I should say, mm -hmm. Nini, I guess all of us are against the certain communistic principles, if yes. not all. Mm -hmm. And in strengthening the Philippines, uh, don't you think that it also strengthens the free world in some way? Well, it's, it doesn't strengthen the free world. I mean, it I mean, helps towards, I mean, uh, democratic colonization. As it strengthens I, I mean, the American way. I, well, I, I mean. want to get Rao to give us some more information about how the... Do you have any personal uh, well, background I, of experience with I, this land? I have history? a personal experience in this kind of work. You see, in the Philippines, we have what we call the Federation of Free Workers. Oh. And uh, the purpose of this is to, uh, well, hire the, uh, shall we say, the standards of the working conditions of laborers, especially the farmers. Now, with regards to farmers, we have a branch under that, the Federation of Free Farmers. And the Federation of Free Farmers has another branch, the Junior Federation of Free Farmers, to which I belong. That started in a Jesuit school, ironically, and I well, belong to I a Benedictine that. school. Oh, see. Well, you see, this is how we do it. We form committees, and every weekend, we go to the remote barrios, about uh, 100 or so miles from the city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. And, well, we bring with ourselves some form of uh, books, magazines, and uh, rice and corn seeds, these flower bags, and we sell them to the people of those uh, small communities which, uh, well, can be reached so easily at a very low price, you see. And most of the time, I mean all of the time, we have to endure so many hardships. Who subsidizes the price? The, yes. the Americans? No, not the Americans. Mm -hmm. We have funds, you know. We get them from the students of the colleges. Oh, there are well, sorts I mean, yes, of, uh, yes, I mean, of uh, uh, membership charity, I mean, fees. I mean, something like charity. Something like that. Oh, I and, see. Uh, well, with regards to the hardships that we encounter, it's uh, most of those lands are below the mountains where there are operations going on with, with, between the communist and government forces. So we have to, well, the fear of dying. So we have to receive Holy Communion <laughs> almost uh, every time we go there. And Do you it, have it many can, communists? Well, uh, it's slowly fading away, you know. And uh, it's not accessible to transportation. So we have to use these uh, Carabao wheel carts, and we ride on them. What are and they? Uh, sometimes when the people don't, uh, well, don't expect us to be going there, they usually, well, we have no food to eat, so we, we turn to unripe bananas and these uh, 
hard bread that they yeah, make in the provinces. Mean, what form of government do you have? Do yes. you have, I mean, democracy? Or we have a democracy. I mean, after the American pattern or after the British pattern? American. It's after the American. I Actually, oh, no wonder. Uh, when did America become interested in Philippines? <laughs> it always well, was. America was, uh, it started uh, around uh, the late 1800s, you know, oh, when see. America took the Philippines away from Spain. See. But, well, you know, the Filipinos are sort of hostile and so recalcitrant that they thought at first that America was selfish. But when America liberated the Philippines from Japan, they really found out that the spirit with which America did those things was a spirit of brotherhood to help the fallen brother rise up once more. Oh, well, I mean, how, how many natural resources have you got? Because I fear, I mean, if America yes. is interested in the Philippines, simply, I mean, America is interested because she wants to exploit your natural resources for her we own benefit. We have benefits. a lot of natural resources, you know. Well, I see a very, a, very, uh, a very easy reason why any country should be interested in another country. Moreover, when this country is far east and when it has the resources, and when it's, as you said, has still communism within the island. I still so. say that uh, America has the motive of strengthening the Philippines in order to strengthen the free world. Excuse me, I want to get back to some of your personal experiences. We can learn so much from them as we understand what's going on in your countries today. You were talking about the inaccessibility of some of these villages that you yes, go into. It was caribou carts. Cheat asked you a question and then it, the answer got lost. Caribou carts that you go on to get there? Yes, Mrs. Waller. And what else? Oh, well, Do you ha ever have some... to walk or hike into them? Well, not, not so much hiking, but... Uh, Sometimes we have to take away, you know, the, the tires of, uh, of uh, jeep, jeep wheels and we'll let them run on the tracks, on the railroad tracks. <laughs> Fortunately, they fit most of the time on the tracks. What if they don't then? If they don't? If they don't, well, we do some hiking. I never knew that a jeep wheel with the tire taken off would fit on a railroad yeah, track. Yeah. the rim. You what just use the rim. Fascinating yeah, means of transportation. It's strange to me, too. <laughs> now, look, all of you who are here have got exceptionally good educations, or you wouldn't have been chosen, but I'd like to know what your schools are doing in your countries to prepare the kind of people that your countries are going to need. Obviously, with these new purposes, you're going to need a different kind of educated man. Well, in the go goes, I mean, it depends upon the educational system. Uh, we have stiff examinations as we go along. And so people who, I mean, we are able to divide the people into classes. People who are fit for technical education go to technical schools. People who can do the academic work go to the academic schools, I mean, the ordinary high schools. And people who, I mean, can do the vocational work go to the trade schools. And so by doing so, we are able to get, I mean, the people for the engineering side and the people for the uh, academic side. How but old do you have to be when you have to decide? I think uh, when you are in the third year of high school, and at that year, you choose your own subject. And by doing so, I think we are now going to produce a lot of engineers. I mean, people who can manage our technical operations or all those things, yes. What about Mexico, Paco? Well, ma'am, Mexico has been carrying it out, uh, shall I say, a great campaign within the last 10 years. Because uh, we have, as a matter of fact, the uh, percentage of ignorant people is very, uh, is, is fair, fairly small, I should say, to the rest of those ones who know when it wasn't like that 10 years ago. What are you, about 60% literate in Mexico now? No, my mark is a little more. More at, than at that? At least 75, at least 75. About 10 or 20 years ago, it was less than 50, yes. wasn't it? Yes, ma'am, it Much was something more. like that. See, what happened was that the government has uh, opened up technical schools and uh, has given all kinds of facilities and uh, make better uh, teachers, you know, be better systems of teaching. And uh, we've been getting places, as you say, with that system. I think this has worked and it's uh, the purpose of the uh, of the, uh, of the Mexican education to teach the masses of the people. I'd like to know what the rest of the uh, fellows here have to say in, in concern of the education because I'm very much interested. See, oh. in India, uh, <coughs> the British, the system that was under the British and that was uh, put in, uh, enforced by the British, the main purpose of that system was to produce scribes and clerks and uh, amanuenses who most of them would not like to work with their hands. They did not understand the dignity of labor. They always wanted these white collar jobs and to sit in a desk and uh, scribble away. They didn't want to use their hands. But when our national government came into being, they changed that system because we knew that unless we realized the dignity of labor, India could not uh, go far. And uh, so the government changed the system. And uh, now we have in quite a number of places, quite a number of schools are after the basic system. 
the basic system is a system in which you are taught uh, woodwork and metalwork and uh, agriculture and all in the lower classes. You start down in the lower classes, so that by the time you get up, you don't have anything against the dignity of labor. Or, and, and you do I have compulsory education for all children oh, yes. in India Our now. constitution says that uh, every, every child should have uh, at least primary education. Compulsory, but that's that not true yet in the Gold Coast, no, is it, Nini? No, free, but not compulsory. Are I mean, uh, the schools belong to the uh, local councils, the various local councils, and uh, I mean, everybody can go to the school, provided you get admission to the school. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Are your teachers Bra British or did they study in, in Great Britain now? Oh yes, most of our teachers do study in Great Britain. I mean, we get a lot of. At this stage, we do like to send a lot of students to various parts of the world. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say that, I mean, I suppose this morning a lot of Goku students arrived at Adelwide Airport. When I was coming, I came with 15 on the same plane, coming to 15. study in the States, yes. And what we, were they going to study here, Nini? Well, they are coming to study in the various fields of, I mean, study. Most of them like to go to the various, I mean, the best universities we can get so far in the world. I mean, for instance, we don't recognize almost all the American colleges. We recognize <laughs> just a few of them because we like to produce the best. Yes, that's what we do. At present, we like to send, I mean, a lot of students overseas to study various things, to come and replace the Englishmen as they Do go. Do they pay their own money or...? Yes, on the Gogos money. The Gogos is, I mean, comparatively a wealthy country, you see. But it's I a mean, government scholarship, I think. It's a government scholarship, scholarship, yes. Government. I mean, most of them are sent by the Coco Marketing Board. The, the Coco Marketing, Marketing Board. Yes, you know, I mean, the Gogos is the chief producer of mm -hmm. cocoa in the world. We produce 50% of cocoa. In order, that, in order to keep the, I mean, the price of cocoa constant in the Gogos, we set up this board. And the board buys cocoa at three pounds a bag in the country, and we sell it to the, to the United States at 15 pounds a bar, <laughs> thereby a creating a large amount of profit, you know, and we use this profit to balance the price in the country in case the price falls in the world market, you know, so always the price is constant. You're telling the United States now. Oh, yes, I'm telling them. It's something, I mean, which is not secret. I mean, we like to get the money there. I mean, without that, we can't carry on with the Volta River project, for instance, which is going to come. I want to money. ask you one more question. What is the most significant development in your country in your lifetimes because you've really been living history people who are in 17 india, and 18. in india the most important political development was that india got its independence from the british that was in 947. After do you remember that what do you remember about it well at that time i was just about eight years old and i as i remember the day the independence was declared i was up in a hill station it, hill station is a town in the hills you now and i was studying out there so my, uh, one day my uncle came and that was Independence Day and he told me that India had got an independence. I was very happy. I didn't know why, but I was. Well, in my case, I think it is a gradual, I mean, development towards self-government. Because uh, throughout my lifetime, I think about four years ago, the Gokos was wholly under the British. But we had to fight for our independence. <laughs> and at present, we've got internal self-government. And we believe that before the end of this year, we are coming to join the United Nations Organization, for instance. You know, what would you well, say, Paco, for well, Mexico? Well, me for Mexico, I think, is uh, carried, shall I say, the flag throughout uh, Latin America. In the 1800s, we were the first country who got its independence in South America, that is, in Latin America. We were the first country who had a university within the uh, American continent. We were the first country in the 1850s who separated the church from the state. We were the first country in 1910, who had, uh, who, who planned and had a well-planned uh, uh, division, shall I say, of the land, of the big landowners against the people who had nothing. And in 1939, we gave a, a, a huge step forward to, uh, to gain our, uh, of the basis of our economy, which is oil, and we took it away from the American company. And that you remember well, I'm yes, sure. I'm sorry, our time's gone. Oh, too bad. <laughs> it went so quickly. Uh, thank you all, Nini and Paco and Genevieve and Cheat and Raoul for taking part in tonight's discussion. We're grateful to the Scholastic Magazines for some of the background material on underdeveloped areas. Next week, the discussion subject will be, do American children have too much freedom? <laughs>
preceding program was distributed by the Educational Television and Radio Center. This is National Educational Television.